Okay, so welcome um, to this third module of the exotic animal practice uh, course, and we're going to look at anesthesia and critical care. Uh, and uh, we're going to start with domestic pets, first of all, small mammals, move on to birds, reptiles, um, and then uh, other species, other potentially wild captive uh, exotic animals, um, and cover anesthesia and analgesia, and then we'll look uh, at um, critical care probably this afternoon, um, principally obviously for uh, exotic pets. Um, so there's a limited amount that we can do with critical care for wildlife and zoo animals, and we'll cover a little bit more about that, to be fair, in those respective modules, but they are challenging to administer critical care to for obvious reasons. Um, so we'll start off and look at anesthesia um, of uh, rabbits. In the first instance, I guess you're all seeing bunnies, yes? There's no totally reptile practices in the room or bird practices in the room. Um, <clears throat> so apologies again for teaching, I'm sure, granny to suck eggs, as they say, but uh, uh, it's probably worth just reiterating some of the issues and problems that can turn a successful rabbit anaesthetic into an unsuccessful one. Um, they are prey species. They are incredibly prone to stress. Uh, and actually, when we're talking about post-operative ileus, um, which I know is, a, is a, a big concern for all of us uh, when we're anaesthetizing rabbits, one of the biggest causes of post-operative ileus is uncontrolled pain and stress going into it. So actually, um, in the vast majority of cases, it's not something that they're just going to develop. Um, so I don't routinely give prokinetics to all of my uh, rabbit anaesthetics. Um, but I do make sure that I am considering the appropriate analgesia for whatever procedure I'm carrying out on them and also try and minimise the amount of time the rabbit spends in a noisy uh, ward, hopefully no time at all in a noisy ward, but at least minimise the amount of time the rabbit's hospitalised so that we can get it in and get it out fairly promptly um, to minimise the stress. The other thing, of course, being uh, hindgut fermenters, small herbivores, um, they need to continuously drip feed food into the digestive system, either it does ha otherwise it does have uh, a um, slowing effect on the gut. Um, so we recommend that you do not starve bunnies um, before uh, anaesthesia. We obviously don't want a huge amount of dry food fed. I mean, a, a, a goodly amount of uh, fibrous, uh, good quality hay or uh, leafy greens is fine. Uh, large amounts of food uh, are to be avoided uh, because the stomach sits obviously on the abdominal side of the diaphragm. It's always full and if it's over distended, um, the main inspiratory effort for bunnies, as with a lot of small mammals, is flattening of the diaphragm. It's not movement of the chest. They've got actually a relatively small chest uh, space in comparison to their abdominal and therefore they've got a large viscous on the other side of the diaphragm that's impeding diaphragm flattening, then again that can uh, lead to potential problems. So they need to be fed, but light uh, amounts of food, preferably of a fibrous nature, um, and try and keep familiar scents and food items. So again, you may well have identified that the rabbit is not on an optimal diet. Um, uh, now, during a period when you're potentially putting it through an anaesthetic, is not the time to suddenly change its diet. Um, you want to do that gradually. Uh, more, We know that in dogs and cats, you want to change over over a few days. With a rabbit, it can take several weeks to gradually change them over. We don't want to suddenly withdraw their obvious food source, their usual food source, and suddenly plonk in the ideal bunny food uh, because they're just not going to accept it the first time around. Uh, and that in itself is going to lead to ileus and potential problems. Familiar scent, so yes, if the owner wishes to bring in the rabbit's blankie or something like that, then let them. Um, you're not just humouring them. Um, obviously, olfaction is an important uh, feature for most of the animals that we deal with. Uh, and rabbits are no different, and so familiar scents and odours uh, are important to minimise stress. The other thing we want to look at um, is pre-anaesthetic examination, and this one actually is perhaps one of the most important, um, and routinely we want to give the rabbit a full physical examination. So even if you did not admit the rabbit, before you administer any anaesthetic, do cast your eyes thoroughly over it, 
We want to obviously be paying particular attention to the respiratory tract. Obviously, if we've got anything like this around the um, upper respiratory tract, we're bound to have something in the lower respiratory tract. They're obligate nasal breathers. So consequently, this is not a good candidate for anesthesia unless it's an emergency procedure. Um, similarly so, I always look in the ears of rabbits as well. Look right the way down the bottom as far as you can. Appreciate in small bunnies, the horizontal ear canal is narrow but short and difficult to visualise, almost impossible to see the tympanum in small bunnies. Um, but actually, I always have a look in the ear because if I can actually see pus at the bottom of the ear canal, clearly that tells me something about the health of the rabbit. It's got middle ear disease. And as I'm sure you're all well aware, middle ear disease can lead to vestibular disease. And I have had rabbits in the past through bitter experience where they did not have vestibular disease, obviously, clinically, before they went through the anaesthetic. I didn't check the ears. They went through an anaesthetic and went on recovery. They then had torticollis. Uh, and that is a difficult explanation to have with an owner. Um, they inherently believe that you've done something to the rabbit to create the vestibular disease, and technically speaking, you have. But nonetheless, it's good to have that conversation up front with the owner and explain to them, OK, you thought it was coming in for a routine castration or a dental. Actually, there's something else serious going on here. I'd really rather like to sort that problem out first because actually it increases the risk of developing other conditions during the anesthesia. So have a good look in the ears. Check them out, particularly the respiratory tract, um, and palpate the abdomen as well for any obvious signs of gas distension um, or potentially uh, blockages. Pre-anesthetic medications, uh, well, the one that um, is frequently discussed, and we'll talk more about this in the critical care and emergency side of things, is glycopyrrolate. We know that rabbits, depending on which particular reference you look at, and some of these are, are quite dated, but nonetheless there is a suggestion that the majority of rabbits over 60% of them do have serum atropinesterases. So I guess it makes some sense. Evolution is a continuous thing. Plants develop atropine. Um, you remember it comes from belladonna, um, woody nightshade, deadly nightshade. And it has parasympathetic effects. Uh, and so what we tend to get um, is uh, um, uh, bright blindness. You get dilation of pupils. But more importantly, as far as anesthesia is concerned, you can get tachycardia associated with atropine. Um, and you can get drying of the mouth uh, and potentially other uh, symptoms as well. So rabbits have developed um, atropinesterases uh, through evolutionary means to be able to allow them to eat many plants that contain these compounds, which developed in the plants, obviously, as a natural deterrent to herbivores. So they don't actually work is the problem. And so when we have an issue with uh, bunnies, uh, uh, and when it, it is a serious complaint, cardiac-wise, we're looking at uh, a heart block as our most uh, significant and important uh, cardiac a dysrhythmia during anesthesia. And actually, when bunnies uh, tend to just spontaneously give up under anesthetic, it is usually because of an undetected heart block, uh, which then goes into a full th third degree heart block and heart failure. Uh, and so glycopyrrolate is a really important emergency crash drug for rabbits. Uh, and some recommend it as a routine pre-medication. So I would always have it on standby, um, but certainly as a pre-med, um, there is some benefit um, to it. Um, varying different doses, 0.1 mg per kg is sort of typical. Um, ACE promazine um, historically has been used. It's not been used so much um, uh, these days because of its uh, inherent inability to, to be reversed. It, it has some positive effects in the fact that it is a tranquilizer. Its negative effects are that obviously it's not very reversible and if the rabbit already has some cardiorespiratory issues then it can cause profound um, hypovolemia and cardiac output failure and so um, it's not generally recommended. Um, fentanyl fluanazone, anybody using fentanyl fluanazone, hypnorm? No, it's kind of fallen out of favour, which is a shame. It's still manufactured by uh, Veta Pharma. Um, it is a, uh, a Schedule II because of the fentanyl uh, aspect of it drug, so it does need to be uh, uh, treated in the same way that uh, morphine and other Schedule II uh, drugs do. It's used recorded, uh, etc., and locked away. Um, however, it has some um, very positive benefits as a pre-med. It can be used as a full general anaesthetic in combination with um, uh, midazolam uh, or diazepam. Uh, it can be used at a high dosage of 0.5 mils per kilogram. So it's dosed on a millilitres per kilogram basis. 
at 0.5 milliliters per kilogram in bunnies as a sedation. So if you're just wanting to do um, a light incisor trim in a, in, a, in a stressy bunny, most of them you can do conscious, but if you've got a really stressy bunny, you can do that. Or you want to take some radiographs, you can give it this particular combination. Its positive effects are, unlike metatomidine and ketamine combinations, um, in a sick rabbit, it is really gentle on the cardiorespiratory system. Uh, and so it rarely results in any significant problems associated with cardiac failure. Um, its negative aspect is that the fentanyl is reversible. You can give um, naloxone, you can give buprenorphine, you can give butorphanol, and that'll reverse the fentanyl part. And so you will get a rabbit going from a deep sedation to a you know, now upright and sort of looking at you, but the fluanazone kind of has to wear off of its own accord. And so recoveries can take an hour or so, uh, whereas if you're used to a very quick recovery with Medket plus or minus butorphanol, that you don't get that. You don't get the suddenly I'm back in the room kind of response. It takes a bit of time. So it takes a bit of getting used to. The other great positive effect of this is that whilst it doesn't seem to significantly drop blood pressure, it dilates very nicely the lateral or marginal ear veins. So if you had difficulty getting uh, uh, vascular access before giving the hip norm, even a low dose at 0.1 mil per kilogram, which is kind of pre-med dosages, just takes the edge off the rabbit if you're then wanting to do a gaseous induction, um, then that uh, dosage also nicely dilates lateral ear vein. So actually you can then get a, an IV catheter in there, you've got vascular access. So it, it is a useful drug. I can guarantee, though, um, because of the, the way that uh, uh, the medicines regulations from the Veterinary Medicines Directorate are currently phrased, that once the vial is broached, you've got to use it within 28 days. You're not seeing a lot of bunnies with this. It could be an expensive option to choose, but I still do use it, uh, and I still find it a useful combination. Metatomidine, obviously, on its own, um, has been used, 0.05 uh, to a 0.1 mix per kg, but often is combined um, with butorphanol um, uh, uh, or potentially um, used straight and just skipping the pre-med and going straight to med-ket combinations as a straight uh, induction. Dexmedetomidine also, there are several papers on its use um, and obviously in milligrams per kilogram is usually used at half uh, the dosage. Um, in the confusing way that they've formulated the preparations, you'll know that still works out at the same milliliters per kilogram because they've actually reduced the, uh, the concentration of the dexmedetomidine from one mg per mil to 0.5 mg per mil, but uh, you'll, you'll understand why. Um, and midazolam, though, can be combined with it uh, 0.2 to 0.5 mg per kg, depending on how stressy your bunny is, uh, or butorphanol, uh, and that is quite a good routine pre-med uh, for healthy rabbits. So ones that have no underlying cardiorespiratory disease, um, ones that have not no hypervolemia or underlying kidney problems. Remember, metatomidine has several um, dysrhythmogenic effects, um, particularly where there are potassium imbalances. So you've got rabbits with diarrhea, you've got rabbits with renal failure, um, then metatomidine should be used with extreme caution. It also shuts down blood supply to organs like the kidneys. Old bunnies have chronic renal disease quite commonly. Uh, it's not an unusual diagnosis, as I'm sure uh, Richard has explained to you in, uh, in the rabbit lectures. Um, and cardiac dysrhythmias as well. Cardiac disease in rabbits is surprisingly common. Atherosclerosis is common in rabbits. Uh, they have been used historically as a model for human atherosclerosis. So they will develop aortic outflow, uh, narrowing damage to heart valves with age is common. Um, and they also can suffer from uh, several other conditions, um, so mediastinal masses, thymic lymphoma and so on in older bunnies, all of which can affect vagal tone, create dysrhythmias. And as I say, heart block is by far and away the most common uh, dysrhythmia in bunnies. And one um, that we do, if you've got a bunny that is uh, uh, of concern to you, then during anesthesia we do recommend that you have an ECG on it or at least have somebody very attentively listening to heart rates and rhythms. Um, but an ECG is a useful thing uh, where, um, should we say, some of the more challenging anesthetics in bunnies are concerned because if you pick up on the heart block very quickly um, and uh, you've either pre-medded with glycopyrrolate or you haven't pre-medded, then you need to be uh, administering glycopyrrolate very quickly uh, in order to stop the progression. Remember, first degree heart block is just that elongation between the P and the QRS complex. That's what you tend to see in the first instance. Uh, and that's what you may 
you may start to hear uh, before you actually get um, cardiac uh, failure. Um, second degree is where you're missing. You haven't got a P wave for every QRS complex, so that it is progressive. And then third degree is where there's complete disconnect between uh, P waves and QRSs, so there's a complete block between the upper chambers and the lower chambers. And what you're getting then is just escape complexes, so usually uh, dystrophic looking QRS waves coming through. Uh, that is incredibly difficult to reverse third degree, so you're wanting to administer your parasympathetics, your glycopyrrolate, uh, when you're at the first and second degree heart block stage, if at all possible, um, to ensure success. Um, for general anaesthesia, as I say, there are a number of combinations that can be used, um, and these are some injectable combinations. Um, historically, as I say, uh, HIPNORM, which is this combination here, so the trade name's HIPNORM, fentanyl fluanazone, um, half a mil per kilogram, as we said, could be used on its own as sedation, but you can also combine um, with uh, drugs like diazepam at two milligrams per kilogram, uh, or midazolam. Um, uh, midazolam, if you're giving it IM, if it's diazepam, then usually they recommend giving it intraperitoneally. Um, so we generally tend to use midazolam and go IM. Uh, but 0 0.3 mils per kilogram of HIPNORM uh, plus two milligrams per kilogram of midazolam would provide full general anesthesia for about 45 minutes. And it's quite a gentle, quite a nice anesthetic, but again, if you're used to triple combination, medcap, butorphanol, recovery is not instant. So when you give the reversal, they don't just roll over and get up. Um, you tend to have um, a slow recovery. Um, it tends to be gentler on the cardio-respiratory system. And we tend to find um, also on blood pressure, it tends to be a little bit more forgiving. Um, but uh, uh, recovery is longer. They're going to be in hospital a little bit longer, so you have to put that into uh, context. And also, as with all injectable combinations, you have to be aware that whilst part of it is reversible, the fentanyl, in an emergency situation, the other bit of it, fluanazone, is not. Um, and if you've got midazolam or diazepam, um, then unless you've got something like flumazanil on hand, which relatively few practitioners have, they're difficult to reverse as well. Um, and even with flumazanil, in my experience, actually diazepam uh, and midazolam are somewhat difficult uh, to reverse. It's not quite the same as giving uh, atipamazole for metatomidine. Metatomidine, in older textbooks, you will see a whole bunch of different um, dosages um, that have been uh, used uh, with metatomidine. Older textbooks tend to um, uh, uh, state much higher dosages than I think are currently being used, and certainly much higher doses than I would be happy using. Um, in fact, the, the, when I first started in practice, the recommended dosage for metatomidine and ketamine in a rabbit uh, was 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram of metatomidine per kilogram, and a ketamine dosage of 35 milligrams per kilogram. We did lose some rabbits, I have to say, during that particular procedure. That was taking a very large hammer to crack a very small nut. So I would not recommend that particular combination there. Um, there has been, interestingly, there's been an increasing trend for trying anesthesia intranasally in varying different species. We'll come back to this in birds, where it's been tried in parakeets and things like that, squirting it up the nose. I'm not entirely sure that I understand why this obsession is, yeah, I mean, I can sort of understand that the putting a large needle in a small rabbit is, is not necessarily a terribly pleasant thing to do, but it's quick and it's fast, and if you're slick and you're using a relatively small gauge needle, you know, these are aqueous solutions, it's not a big deal, these aren't large volumes. So I'm not entirely sure. Whereas sticking something up a rabbit's nose is actually quite aversive. If you've ever tried um, to swab a rabbit's nose with pasteurylosis, or you've ever tried to pass a feeding tube in a rabbit, you have to sedate it or give it at least, first of all, a really good spray of local anaesthetic into the nasal passages and give it 15 minutes and then come back to it. They don't like it. I'm not surprised. I mean, we don't like having things shoved up our nose. So, um, and this particular... Um, publication, shall we say, um, peer-reviewed publication, um, also found that if you kept them in dorsal recumbency, some of them died. <laughs> so I think the dosage was possibly a little bit out there, and I think the management of airway, which we'll come back to increasingly with rabbits, is vitally important. If you're doing anything with a rabbit and you are anaesthetizing it, secure an airway. Um, this is the most important thing, because some of them do just stop breathing. Uh, and that can be obviously a challenge, uh, but if you've got control of the airway, it's sortable. Um, not if it isn't. So 
I put this one in here for, for, for interest. Um, it's a fairly recent publication. Um, these sorts of combinations here, 0 0.1 mix per kg metatomidine, 5 mix per kg ketamine with butorphanol at 0 0.5 mix per kg, um, are typical uh, with triple combinations. And metatomidine, butorphanol, buprenorphine, midazolam, butorphanol, buprenorphine, followed by alfaxalone is also uh, a current um, trended, and alfaxalone was we'll mentioned in a second, is actually now obviously, as I'm sure you're all well aware, licensed in rabbits. Hypnorm actually is also licensed in rabbits. So it's an interesting situation with Hypnorm because it's now become um, slightly less commonly used. Technically speaking, it's been around since um, pretty much the early 80s, and for rats, mice, guinea pigs, and rabbits, it was a licensed um, sedation. And then if you combine with midazolam, or diazepam, it became an anaesthetic. But because the midazolam and the diazepam weren't licensed, you couldn't say that the actual anaesthetic combination was licensed in rabbits. So it's another one of these wonderful gray areas that we sort of float around in under the cascade. VMD are usually pretty pragmatic because these are non-food producing animals and therefore they're fairly okay about it. But actually, if we're looking at what is a licensed anaesthetic for rabbits, there is no whole combination of drugs that technically is completely licensed for rabbits unless you're going just for gaseous isoflurane anesthesia, which in itself can be somewhat uh, uh, problematic. Um, I mentioned for completeness sake these two here, or these three here, I should say, um, but again, I don't recommend them. So older texts, xylazine and ketamine, if anybody's still using xylazine, I, I, you can't reverse it that easily. It's not a great drug. It, Marini suggested that actually you've got quite a lot of myocardial hypoxia associated with it. Clearly not a good thing. Um, so consequently, I would, I would scrap that particular one. Propofol, yes, you can induce anesthesia with a, a, a continuous uh, total infusion uh, of uh, uh, propofol at 0.7 mg per kg per minute intravenously or intraosseously. Um, you can induce at 10 mg per kg IV if you can get a lateral ear vein. Um, but you do get, even at slow induction rates, significant bradypnea and actually in a lot of cases apnea. So again, personally speaking, why put yourself under that amount of stress? I'm not entirely sure. You've then got to get secure an airway, effectively. So you've done it, you've induced it, oh, now I've got to actually get a tube in it. Um, I'm not sure that that, in a busy practice, is a good thing to be doing to yourself. It's putting the rabbit under a lot of adrenal stress and putting you under a lot of adrenal stress as well. So personally, I would, I would leave the propofol out. Um, and sim similarly, a ketamine propofol combination, ketafol, five mix per kg of a one, point one to one uh, mix per kg ketamine propofol solution has also been used. Uh, there's a couple of publications out on that. Smooth IV induction, but profound apnea again. So it's possible to induce anesthesia. The anesthetic, providing you can secure the airway and breathe for the rabbit, is fine. But you've got to secure an airway and breathe for the rabbit. Now, in general, we would want to be doing that anyway, but I don't think you want to put yourself in a position where you absolutely have to because you're going to lose the patient. Alfaxalone uh, currently obviously has a license in bunnies. Um, interestingly, before it received a license, one study at three mg per kg uh, by Gill et al. in 2012 uh, showed significant cardiorespiratory depression and adrenal stress. I mentioned that just in passing. Um, it has received a license for its use, um, but at four mg per kg uh, IV, uh, with a pre-med, and the pre-meds that they recommend are metatomidine and butorphanol, or metatomidine and uh, buprenorphine, or potentially midazolam and butorphanol, or uh, diazepam uh, and uh, butorphanol or buprenorphine. Um, so personally speaking, therefore, if you've got a slightly more debilitated rabbit, I'd go with a benzodiazepine uh, and a partial opioid, gentler on the cardiorespiratory system, Nice effect on the bunny, a little bit more difficult to reverse because you get a little bit of a hangover effect of the benzodiazepine. If you've got a fit, healthy bunny, then I would go with metatomidine plus a partial opioid because you can then reverse the metatomidine really quickly with the atropamazole. And I guess if you get into trouble, you, you know, you can do that anyway. Um, but I would avoid using metatomidine wherever you have an elderly bunny with questionable renal uh, function um, or heart issues. Uh, in those two cases, I would certainly uh, try and avoid an alpha-2. Um, as I say, with a pre-med, four milligrams per kilogram given intravenously, as I'm sure, anybody using this currently, alfaxalone? 
Okay, so I say it, it is. It is it does have a license for bunnies. They recommend you give it slowly, so a quarter of the dosage every 15 seconds. So this is a real slow induction because again, it does produce apnea <coughs> at this sort of rate with a premed. It really does cause um, uh, apnea. Um, but you, if you don't use a premed, then it's a slightly higher dosage of five milligrams per kilogram. But they are recommending you do intubate in these cases because of the risk of apnea. So again, you've got a bunny that you know has potentially historically been a challenge to intubate. This is maybe not the anaesthetic combination for you because you're putting yourself in a lot of stress and potentially risking the patient. Uh, if you're pretty comfortable with the uh, technique, and we'll look at uh, a couple of other uh, <coughs> options later on, um, then okay, fine, I would use it. Um, it works really nicely. Um, but we're talking about really um, giving you a short period of general anesthesia, about sort of 10, 15 minutes. Um, you're gonna need to then keep the bunny either topped up with the same sort of medication, or you're looking at putting it onto gaseous anesthesia to continue. Um, so in most of these cases, we're kind of using this not so much as a full general anesthetic, we're using this as an induction agent, as um, we would more typically use it in a, uh, a dog or a cat, or a reptile. Um, so to maintain, uh, we obviously have two main gaseous anaesthetics that we're currently uh, working with. Uh, both have benefits and minuses. Uh, both are obviously closely related. Uh, isoflurane, you should be aware, again, is the, and depends on the formulation of isoflurane, um, <coughs> but some of these are licensed for use in exotics. Uh, whereas sevaflurane currently has yet to receive a license for use in exotics. So we should be aware of that and therefore be prepared to justify the use of sevo over iso. Uh, personally speaking, I think that is justifiable. I think sevaflurane, I think most anaesthetists, uh, and I'm not an anaesthetist, I'm just a vet who does anaesthesia, um, but uh, as most anaesthetists would um, uh, back you up that sevaflurane is a superior uh, gaseous anaesthetic, particularly for mammals. Um, we have some issues with reptiles, but with mammals, um, it works really nicely. Um, the great advantage of it is that potentially you could use it without a pre-med because it's not as irritant as isoflurane, so you could go straight for gaseous induction. Uh, my favorite um, technique um, with uh, gaseous anesthesia is um, to use wherever possible a pre-med, just to take the edge off the bunny and then to do um, face masks, not plonking the rabbit's head fully in the face mask, but you know, just loosely uh, pointing the head of the rabbit into the face mask, and then using stepwise induction uh, with either isoflurane or sevaflurane. So give them oxygen for a couple of minutes, 100%, get them nicely pink, um, and then start half a percent or 1% if you're on the uh, sevatec um, at a time for a couple of minutes if they're still breathing very nicely, then go up again another percent or half a percent if you're talking about isoflurane. And keep doing that in a stepwise fashion until usually with isoflurane, you're at about one and a half to two percent, and then you're at general anesthetic levels. Sevaflurane, you're usually at about three, maybe three and a half percent. Um, and at that point, you've lost the writing reflex, use the pinch reflex, and we'll talk a little bit more about monitoring in a second, um, particularly in hind limb, first of all. Remember that the pinch reflex in rabbits in the forelimb is retained to quite deep levels of general anesthesia. So you will get a little bit of a pullback uh, in a bunny that potentially um, is still okay to castrate or to spay. You'll get no pinch reflex on ears, you'll get no pinch reflex on toes or tail, but you may just get a little bit of a pullback on the forelimb with a deep pain pinch. Depends how hard your pinch is, I guess. But there is a, there is a, a local uh, reflex arc uh, with the forelimbs in bunnies, which can, can still give you a forelimb withdrawal. Isoflurane, straight face mask on its own is quite irritant, and we generally don't recommend it. Bra rabbits do breath hold. So I wouldn't go storming in, you know, with a full 5% uh, isoflurane and oxygen on a bunny. It, it is likely to breath hold. Um, so give it a pre-med and do a stepwise. Sevaflurane, you may be able to do that. I generally go at 4%. You find that 8% it is still irritant and you'll get some bunnies that will breath hold, okay? Um, if you've got an induction chamber big enough to get a rabbit into, then okay, fine, you could do it that way. Um, and then that avoids the, the, the face mask right on the end of the face, which some rabbits find aversive. Um, however, 
um, health and safety, and it depends upon your practice. Some practices I know have banned uh, induction chambers completely and utterly uh, because of the risks of um, uh, anesthetist and surgeon inhalation of uh, these gases. And so face masks may be your only other option, and in which case I would start um, at no higher than 4% at sevoflurane. But actually, if you've got a healthy bunny, you can do a stepwise induction and really very quickly, uh, just notching up 1% at a time, um, you can do a, a, a mask induction on a, on a bunny. So, in all cases, if you're doing anything other than sedating a bunny, so if you are going for general anesthesia of a bunny, then I would recommend that you try and secure an airway in all cases. Um, so there are three main techniques um, that we can use. There's obviously the blind um, intubation. Um, this one is clearly difficult if the bunny is not breathing. Um, so this is not the one to try if the bunny is not breathing in the first instance. If it's breathing very nicely, then the easiest way of doing this is to have your bunny flat in sternal, um, so equally um, uh, balanced right and left, um, to pick the head up if you're right-handed uh, with your left hand and just gently elevate the head so that the forepaws are flat to the table and the head is in a normal position. And then use your ET tube and use the curve of it to insert the ET tube just to one side of the incisors into the midline and use the curve of the ET tube to direct it to the back of the throat whilst listening to the end of the ET tube. And you will hear obviously the increased breathing sounds as you get closer to the glottis. The curve just pushes the soft palate up on the ET tube so that it disconnects because obviously the soft palate is ventral to the uh, epiglottis. It just pushes that up and you will hear the breathing and then just on the inspiration, insert. <coughs> now with practice, this actually becomes quite an easy technique with any bunny that's over a kilogram in weight. Okay, and we're generally using kilogram bunny, probably a two and a half millimeter ET tube, um, kilo and a half, probably um, uh, uh, three, um, up to two kilos, a three uh, millimeter ET tube, and above two kilos, probably a three and a half to four going increasingly up. Generally, these are uncuffed, so you want a relatively snug fit, but obviously you've got to get the tube in uh, in the first place. If they're not breathing, you don't have this option because you can't listen to the sounds. And generally, the rough rule I have with blind intubation is I do try it, and I do still use it as a technique, and I try three times, and if I'm not working it three times, I either go for direct visualization, or if things are really not going well, I'll bail out. And that may be something else that you want to keep in the back of your mind is don't be afraid to bail out of an anaesthetic. If things are not going right, you know, the gods of anaesthesia are telling you something on that day, listen to them, stop. It's better to stop and call a halt to it and give the owner back a live bunny than to persist blindly with a, I can do this, I can do this, um, and then fail. So set yourself some targets. Myself, I go with three strikes and you're out. If I can't do it three strikes blind, I will then go to direct visualization unless the bunny is toiling, in which case I may just reverse everything um, and come back another day. Owners are always very forgiving when you give them back a live rabbit. They're not generally very forgiving when you give them back a non-live rabbit. Um, direct visualization obviously is, is uh, another technique uh, which we're obviously more familiar with in uh, other domestic pets. Um, it is a challenge because of the narrow airway uh, or narrow oral cavity, I should say, that bunnies have. I personally find it easiest with the bunny on its back. So I find it easier in dorsal recumbency. Some others find it easier in ventral. You can do it either way. It's not a big problem, whichever works best uh, for you. Um, the advantage of dorsal as well, in my experience, is that clearly you also have you know, kind of done a litmus test on how deep your anaesthetic is because you th think the rabbit's anaesthetized because it's being a prey species has a habit of hunkering down and pretending it's, you know, anaesthetized when it's not actually. And you try and then put it fully on its back and then there's a slight sort of tensing and you can go, well, I'm not deep enough yet. Okay, so we'll, we'll just carry on with the face mask side of things because you need the rabbit fully anaesthetized at this point in order to do this. So if you've done the uh, IV injection, okay, fine. It probably should be fully anaesthetized. If you're doing a stepwise gaseous, you need to make sure it is we're looking at, if you're using um, uh, traditional blades, a Wisconsin Zero Blade, pediatric blade, um, you can buy uh, rabbit-specific blades, which have a slightly longer, narrower blade with a light source right at the very end. Uh, so Paul Flecknell has designed one. 
Uh, Alsto used to sell it, I think it's still being sold through um, Meadows Animal Health and a couple of other uh, 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 retailers. Um, they're quite pricey, those ones, but they're very good. Um, a guide wire, however, to aid insertion of your tube may be necessary because in small bunnies, what you tend to find in this position um, is with a narrow aperture and the uh, laryngoscope in the way, as soon as you then insert the ET tube, your vision is gone. You cannot then see the epiglottis. So it's, it then becomes a blind insertion. So guide wires are cheap and easy to buy. Everybody sells them. And basically, they are literally that. They are a small wire, um, sometimes plastic coated, that you, because of the, the, the thin diameter, you can see it going into the epiglottis. You insert it through uh, the glottal opening. Um, you hold it there. You pull your laryngoscope back out and then slot your ET tube over the top of it. Um, and then thread it down and use it as a guide to insert your ET tube straight into the trachea. Um, and then if you want to reinsert your laryngoscope to confirm, but I mean, usually you can uh, then start bagging the animal and actually get uh, respiratory movement. Um, clearly, there is also another um, technique. So there's been a product that's been around for a couple of years now, three or four years now, which is the V-gel. Anybody using V-gels? Yeah, okay. Um, so they have cat and they have rabbit ones. They've invented a couple of different size rabbit ones. The original one just had one size bunny, which kind of doesn't work. Um, so they've now produced um, different sizes for different size bunnies, which makes life a little bit easier. For those that aren't familiar uh, with the product, um, I hasten to add I have nothing to do with um, the company that manufactures this, but uh, um, the, the uh, tube itself has, at the end of it, it's basically inside there just a basic bog standard ET tube. Um, it has a little side port for sampling for, for CO2. The larger ones have a little cuff. Um, but what it has um, at the uh, end of it is a small, um, uh, soft, uh, in the larger ones, inflatable cuff. And instead of, a, uh, of an end opening at a shallow, uh, sorry, at an acute angle, it has a longer opening at a shallow angle with this cuff around it. So the cuff, there is a cuff at the top here, which will inflate and block the airway, but there is actually also a cuff around the opening at the bottom here as well. And the idea is it's inserted over the top of the epiglottis. So effectively, this opening will now sit above the glottal opening itself. The cuff around here can be inflated to fill the back of the oropharynx. There is also a bung um, on this end, which is another adaptation that they've gone through with the different uh, iterations of this product, which plugs um, the esophagus to stop gas going down uh, the esophagus. So effectively, it's not an intubation. It is sitting as a um, uh, epiglottal uh, or pharyngeal mask um, connected, therefore, to um, your anesthetic circuit and providing air, keeping the epiglottis away uh, from, sorry, keeping the uh, soft palate away from the epiglottis. So where it is difficult to intubate, where it is difficult to visualize um, the epiglottis, where you are struggling um, to intubate but you wish to carry on, um, and in emergency situations, um, this V-gel can be a very useful technique. It's, it's been based on pediatric uh, pharyngeal masks in, for, for little infants, neonatal infants, uh, that are also tricky to intubate. Um, it can provide um, oxygen and potentially therefore anesthetic gases directly um, to the top of the airway. But because it is not an intubation, it has some problems. And I therefore only use this product. I think it's an important part or useful part of a crash trolley. Um, and I think it's a useful uh, adjunct should you wish to carry on and can't intubate for whatever reason. Personally, I prefer to intubate for two main reasons. The first one is, as you can see, it is entirely dependent upon the orientation of tube and rabbit to ensure that the airway is kept open. If you move rabbit from ventral to dorsal recumbency or the other way, um, you need to make sure that the orientation of the tube stays exactly the same. If there's any twisting of the tube, then this opening here suddenly becomes not over the top of the epiglottis and is sticking to the wall of the pharynx and all of a sudden you've got an occluded airway, potentially. So it is problematic in that sense. You need to be acutely aware of what the orientation of bunny um, and uh, tube is. 
you also need to be aware that this bung that goes down into the esophagus has been designed because of previous problems associated with these types of tubes. Um, so when I originally uh, worked um, in emergency uh, uh, clinics for a certain company that I shan't mention, um, we found that using the original pediatric, because these things didn't exist at the time, using pediatric cuffed tubes, which was all that we had, uh, was problematic in bunnies because uh, in about half of the cases, they didn't have this little bung that plugged the esophagus. In about half of the cases, um, you delivered gas straight down the esophagus and into the stomach. So it didn't all go down the trachea. Quite a lot of it went down the esophagus. Now remember, rabbits are obligate diaphragm breathers. So if the diaphragm cannot flatten because there's now an inflating viscous on the other side of the diaphragm that's stopping it from doing that, you're actually going to be impeding the ability for the rabbit to breathe. So you're actually making it worse rather than better. So that has been improved by this bung. In my experience, it hasn't completely gone away. And that's the problem with not having, you know, having multiple different sizes of bunnies and not having, you know, a complete and utter range of different sizes of these tubes to fit them. Because we deal with everything from a bunny of 300 grams up to something that is the best part of about, you know, 16 <laughs> kilos. These are huge variations. It's like dog breeds. You know, you can't necessarily get one size fits all or indeed even three or four sizes fits all. So useful product, I do use it. I think it's um, very useful in certain specific circumstances, but do be aware it does have some drawbacks and I wouldn't use it as an easy cop out for not trying intubation. I would go for intubation in the first instance. Um, circuit wise for anesthesia, general gaseous anesthesia, obviously most of the ones we're using as T pieces. You may want for the little dwarf breeds to start thinking about mini banes. Mapleson C's, this is a little Mapleson C here. So the gas comes in down this particular line here. Um, the ET tubes connected at this point here. Um, that's the valve. It's got a little um, 0.5 litre rebreathing bag on this one. You can get 0.25 litre rebreathing bags. So minimal dead space is what we're talking about for things that are less than a kilo, definitely. Um, you may want to consider that. Clearly, if we're getting into giant breeds, then we may be looking at lax um, and. Uh, yeah, I suppose potentially maybe even a Baines as well. Right, so monitoring of an, a bunny anesthesia. So we have the um, usual physical monitoring. Um, if you can get an esophageal um, uh, stethoscope uh, in, if you've not got too many tubes coming out of your very little bunny, um, then that's quite useful. Um, it does make life a lot easier when you're dealing with a small patient um, where they're just big enough to get that sort of tube into them because it means that your anaesthetist is not then, you know, continually guggling about underneath um, the uh, drapes trying to find a heart uh, uh, rate. Um, respiratory rates, generally 30 to 60 beats a minute. Heart rates in most rabbits uh, anaesthetized, the larger ones, uh, may be in the sort of 120 to 130. Uh, little ones may be up to sort of 260, 280. Um, when we're talking about physical responses, as we mentioned, loss of the deep pinch reflex in the forelimbs um, only occurs at deep levels of general anesthesia. Uh, so we generally tend to retain this for most anesthetics where you're doing abdominal surgery. You will get, if you put a really deep, you know, you put a set of hemostats across a nail bed or something like that, you will get a slow withdrawal on the forelimbs. You won't get it in the hind limbs. You won't get nail pinch reflexes in ears or tail but you will often get it um, in uh, the forelimbs. This is a bit of a problem when you're doing forelimb surgery, uh, and generally forelimb surgery in rabbits, I tend to do a nerve block. Um, so my preferred nerve block uh, in bunnies is a brachial plexus block. I'm just slightly digressing. Um, So if I'm wanting to do um, surgery on the forelimb of my bunny, I'll do a nerve block in similar fashion to that that one would do in a dog or a cat. So orientate yourself with the, the, the scapula um, and find, I mean, it's really easy to find the suprahamate process on the scapula of bunnies is that bony bit at the bottom of the, of the scapula. And you're aiming for that kind of point there from the cranial aspect you're wanting to insert 
your needle. So get yourself a fine um, uh, 23 or you know, usually a, a, an inch long 23 in a big bunny um, or uh, if you can get a, a long thin 25 or 27 gauge needle uh, for a smaller one. You're wanting to insert it to the depth um, of the spine of the scapula. You're wanting to aim it just proximal to the shoulder joint um, and you're wanting um, from um, medial to lateral to just literally run it up along the inside of the scapula, okay? Because you're wanting to hit the brachial plexus that's in that area there. Uh, and then in a small bunny, um, you can put sort of 0.1 to 0.2 mils uh, of um, lignocaine without adrenaline uh, in there. Um, in a bigger bunny, you may need sort of 0.3 to 0.5. If it's a giant breed, maybe 0.5. Um, and that'll give you full limb uh, anesthesia. Obviously, remember, um, that's probably going to give you a good 45 minutes of limb anesthesia, so remember that on recovery. Um, but if you're going to do, you know, a lot of orthopedic work in there, um, you've got two choices. You've either deepened the anesthesia, at which point you may well be breathing for your bunny, uh, because it is now apneic, um, because it is so deep that to keep it uh, immobile uh, uh, on the table, stop this withdrawal reflex every time you're manipulating the limb, or do a nerve block in that area. Um, and then you can maintain a lighter plane of anesthesia, um, which may be better for the bunny, um, but still do the surgery you need to do uh, on the limb. So, um, some things to look out for. Obviously, eye positioning in bunnies is not a useful technique for depth of anesthesia. Their eyes are huge um, and give them you know, nearly 360 degree vision. Um, they, don't, they don't move the eye positioning. Um, you don't tend to get a significant, you, you do get a corneal reflex, but because of the protruding eyes, it's quite difficult to ascertain that corneal um, reflex, that movement of a third eyelid. It doesn't tend to be like a bird where it sort of moves right the way across the surface of the eye. Um, however, there are some things that about the eye that you should notice. If you start to get ocular protrusion, that is really bad news. That's you know significantly um, increased vagal tone. You've got very high vagal tone at that point. You've almost certainly got a heart block. So, you know, if, if hopefully the anaesthetist will have picked up on the slowing heart rate in the first instance or looked at the ECG, if you get to the point where the eyes are generally protruding, that's not good news. Um, that does mean um, that there is profound vagal tone. There may well be um, something more sinister going on. Um, pulse oximetry. Um, so this has been used in a number um, of different uh, publications um, in... Uh, bunnies, um, and interestingly, um, the same paper um, that looked at um, pulse oximetry looked at capnography in bunnies uh, and tried to correlate it between um, uh, SpO2 and SaO2 um, and tried to see what sort of correlation there was. To be fair, the, the, it was relatively small numbers, um, but the correlation was poor. Um, so, again, I use pulse oximetry in bunnies. Um, however, I'm not entirely convinced that I rely on it because a lot of them, particularly the cheaper models, have an upper limit, certainly for heart rates. So that's one thing if you're dealing with a really small bunny. You may think you've got the most stable anaesthetic in the world because the heart rate is bang on 250 beats a minute all the way through. Maybe just the manufacturers, that's the problem with the pulse oximeter. It only reads up to 250, so it will just read 250 all the way through the anaesthetic, no matter what's happening with the uh, 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 cardiac rate. Um, but as far as the actual SpO2 is concerned, um, going back to uh, uh, first principles, blood uh, results, blood gases, are a more accurate assessment um, of oxygen saturation. Um, but we do use the central ear artery, and we do use um, the... Uh, pedal uh, vessels in bunnies. You may need to shave a little bit on the foot to get a good contact there. Um, and some certainly larger bunnies, if you've got a, a rectal probe, you can tape it to the underside of the tail and go for the for the um, coccygeal vessels in that area there. Um, and again, we'd be expecting to see 97% or above. Remember, it's um, a, a sigmoid curve, dissociation curve, uh, SpO2, um, and uh, once you drop below 93%, you're getting significant hypoxia. Um, so you start to get cyanosis of membranes, uh, you know, when you drop off the bottom of sort of 90%. So we need to have it in the upper, upper 90s to be, to be confident. But if at all unsure, and you do have a blood gas uh, uh, device 
uh, in the practice, an ISTAT or an EPOC, then you may want to just correlate that uh, with preferably an arterial O2. But if you can't, I mean, use a central ear artery if you're very careful and don't create a thrombus. If you create a thrombus, you might lose the ear tip um, later on. Uh, but if you're using very fine uh, uh, insulin needles for sample, uh, you may be able to do that. If you don't want to do that, then obviously you can use venous because, yes, if your venous blood's at 100% saturation of oxygen, fine, great. You know, your oxygen levels are absolutely chipper. There's not a problem. Um, capnography, again, unfortunately, in this particular publication, suggested that um, it's not as accurate as measuring blood arterial gas measurements, and there was a poor correlation between end tidal carbon dioxide um, and arterial uh, carbon dioxide. Um, so in the if you look at page 7 here, and this was uh, Eatwell et al. 2013, so basically their, their finding, fundamental finding, was arterial blood gas analysis was much more accurate. Um, ranges of um, arterial carbon dioxide of 25.29 to 40.37 millimetres of mercury and arterial oxygen of 50.3 to 98.2 were considered normal. I would tactfully suggest that that is a wide range and actually from my perspective and certainly from my experience in this um, that anything in a CO2 above 30 and I'm starting to be a bit nervous and jumpy about it and anything in an oxygen that's below about 85 I would be concerned okay really if it's on oxygen and you've got it intubated it really should be above 85 millimeters uh, of mercury p uh, arterial oxygen and the arterial carbon dioxide should be less than 30 35 at the absolute out outside so I think a couple of these rabbits were possibly slightly hypoxic so joys the small sample sets uh, and all the rest of it. Um, if we're talking about um, uh, capnography, in most cases we're looking at side stream capnography. I think most, most veterinary um, capnographs are side stream um, because of this small volume um, of exploration that's going on with, with a lot of the smaller uh, breeds of bunny that we use. Um, the one thing to say about capnography is I know that some people use it on face masks Really, I'm not entirely sure how you interpret a face mask capnograph. Um, that really doesn't make a lot of sense because they're breathing room air all around it unless you've got it so tightly welded to the rabbit's face that it's probably going to have a bit of ischemic facial necrosis afterwards. I'm not sure how that one works. So on intubation, absolutely. On, on, on face mask, I'm not sure that capnography makes any sense with this caveat in mind that it's not that accurate, it appears, uh, on, uh, uh, on intubation. So arterial blood gas measurement certainly is viewed still as the gold standard. It, it certainly is in dogs and cats. Um, but we can get trends, and that's the important thing with cat catnography. We can look at trends. If we, if we set our markers down at the beginning, and this is the same with ECGs, if we know what our rate and rhythm was at the start, we can mark that down. It's good practice to get your anaesthetist, or if you are the anaesthetist, um, to mark down exactly what the values were when you started the process. Um, if you're plotting it on a graph, on a chart, then absolutely marvellous, that's grand. Um, but just then periodically sample every five minutes or so um, and uh, look at trends because that can tell you more than anything else, even if the actual value is not 100% uh, uh, accurate. Um, rectal temperature, don't forget the basics. Um, these animals um, often have a very large body surface area in relation to volume. Um, if you've got an X lap, then you've opened up the abdominal cavity to the room air. If it's the first op that morning and folk have not been in and turned on the uh, radiators and it's a bit nippy in the surgery that morning, these animals are going to uh, rapidly cool. So warmed fluids, often after X lapse, will put warmed physiological saline or warmed physiological lactated ringers into the abdominal cavity afterwards. It's quite a useful way of providing a little bit of hydration for the bunny uh, on recovery. It also helps warm and keep everything up. So uh, if you keep it up to, uh, you know, 36 degrees uh, centigrade, try not to obviously cook the bunny, um, but uh, normal rectal temperatures anywhere from 38.5 up to sort of 40. Um, Warmed IV fluids, um, sure, we can use those, but obviously um, don't forget uh, radiant heat mats. These are um, like the sort of reptile 
uh, heat mats that you can get. A lot of the pressure heat mats will work for bunnies over two kilos, but often don't work for bunnies under two kilos. So remember a lot of the green mats that have got a pressure ones, they've got to have some weight on them to actually stimulate heat. Uh, so a lot of the light bunnies actually never generate any heat at all. So you may be better with a radiant heat mat or going down the route of warm water circulating pads or things like bear huggers. Clearly the problem with those is losing your patient underneath all of the sheets and things that you've got uh, the animal on. But even simple things such as putting tin foil on feet and ears. Sounds crazy, looks like the oven ready bunny. Owners would probably freak if they came into the theatre at that precise moment in time. They freak because they see a bunny on the table, so that's going to happen. But the point is, um, these are areas where you're going to lose heat, ears particularly, uh, in rabbits, clearly. So actually do think about insulating those areas. If you're at all concerned about it, um, then it's worth wrapping your bunny uh, well um, uh, in order to uh, reduce heat loss. Uh, I put this one in because this is, this is clearly the future. Um, cerebral state monitors. So there are a couple of publications that have been used, obviously, in humans um, to produce cerebral state index scores. And obviously, they've been used in, in dogs uh, as well. Um, we have um, uh, a couple of studies in bunnies. Um, uh, Yin et al. certainly showed a close correlation between the cerebral state index and the sedation score. Uh, and they suggested, therefore, that it would uh, be a useful tool going forward, rapidly uh, reflecting brain electrical activity. Um, and um, isofluorane uh, rabbits um, recovered faster than those anesthetized with propofol, and that despite some changed cases showing limb movement during anesthesia, there was no change in CSI. So if we want some um, comfort over this bit, because I know some people go, oh God, it's not anesthetized when limbs move, and that is a worry, uh, and I understand that, but actually we do have some hard science that actually backs that up uh, with this cerebral state uh, index monitor, uh, as I say, which may well uh, be, uh, be the future of veterinary anesthesia, um, or monitoring anyway, uh, that the rabbits are still anesthetized when they have this withdrawal. It is a spinal reflex in the case of this forelimb uh, movement. Okay, um, what we'll do, we'll just do a little bit on rodent anesthesia, and I think we'll have a, a, a break. Are there any questions on rabbit anesthesia? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I've, I've used it. I've not used it on its own. Um, I've used it as a top up. So, for example, uh, where I've used um, a low dose of hypnorm, so the 0 0.1 mil per kilogram, or a low dose, very low dose of metatomidine and butorphanol, so something like 0 0.05 mg per kg of metatomidine and maybe about sort of 0.2 mg per kg of butorphanol, because I've got a rabbit I'm a bit concerned about. Um, I want a quick, quick, quick reversal. And then I've done that, and I've gone, oh, right, there's, there's, there's a tooth that just needs bird at the back of the mouth. You know, so always only dental ones, and you open the mouth up, you give them that little bit, and then you open the mouth up and go, oh, hell, I've now got to, to, to burr that tooth, and there is, it's not sleep enough for me to open the mouth up. A little bit of IV midazolam at that point, yes. Um, so anywhere from zero, I do it to effect. So I start off at 0 0.5 mg per kg, and you can go up to two, uh, and give it via the lateral ear vein. Um, and the rabbit just then calms down enough to allow you to open the mouth up and then just, but I wouldn't do anything obviously noxious, really noxious, not dental extraction or anything underneath that because that's not anesthesia, but enough to sedate the rabbit to allow a procedure, yes, I do find midazolam in particular IV quite useful. Rabbits respond quite nicely to it. The downside is there, you can try flumazenol if you can get hold of it. It's quite expensive and sometimes difficult to get hold of. You can try reversal, but it's not quite the same as the atipamazole reversal of metatomidine. You don't get like the instant reversal. The good news is that midazolam seems, touch wood, at those doses just to be incredibly safe in bunnies. They respond quite nicely to those sorts of tranquilizers. Um, and I've not seen an issue with it. So yeah, useful, useful drug. Quite often just to deepen a sedation to allow maybe a procedure that's not a surgical one, but nonetheless needs that rabbit to be just that bit more relaxed. Okay, yeah, no, that, that, that's a good point. Um, the short answer is um, purely based on history of patient in the first instance and what its presenting signs are. So history of patient, if I had problems in the past, okay, so that's first. 
Um, presenting signs if it's digestive tract related, it's problem, okay? So it's dental disease, and a lot of these bunnies are, then yes, I will consider using a prokinetic at that point. Um, but I'll make sure, first of all, that I'm fully analgesed in the first instance. And my first line use of prokinetics will be metoclopramide combined with ranitidine. We'll, we'll talk about these a little bit later on, so don't worry, we'll, we'll come back to these. But my first line will be ranitidine um, and metoclopramide. Um, I keep propulsive, I keep um, cisapride, um, used to be called propulsive, uh, cisapride in backup uh, for the cases that don't work. Um, but routinely, I will not use prokinetics for like a castration or a spay. Um, I will use good preoperative analgesia. So we'll use our, our analgesics before, obviously, surgery. Um, so standard one will be a non-steroidal like meloxicam which seems to be um, wide safety margins. We'll use it at 0 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. So we'll use it at high dosages. Again, we'll talk a little bit about analgesia in a minute. Um, if I think I'm going to be doing something more unpleasant to the animals, like an orthopedic op, then yes, I will consider using prokinetics in those cases because I know the pain is going to be higher. I'm going to be using other painkillers like buprenorphine. Um, I may be using fentanyl. Um, but therefore, my chances of having post-op elius is, is increased. So in those cases, yes, I will use a pre-op metoclopramide and ranitidine, um, and then we'll follow that on post-op with assisted feeding. For routine surgeries, what about that? I don't use it for routine surgeries where I think I can control the pain adequately. Yeah. It's the ones where you're just in that unknown yeah. ground. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. We have uh, epileptic bunnies. Uh, so, um, okay. Uh -huh. And she has really bad teeth. Okay. So last time I started with uh, raising like six to six to seven inch teeth mm -hmm. to get him calm, and then um, that that just went away. But yep. do we have a safer option to this because maybe we have to be off the head too for the apple. Yeah. I, I mean, I I'd, I'd use midazolam. Midazolam would be the way that I would go. Um, and yes, I would I would consider. The difficulty is, is how you get these drugs into the bunny before it comes into the surgery, because I don't think there's any way that you can do that. Um, so realistically speaking, on, on admit, I would, I would give a, a, an IM injection of midazolam, um, and then obviously make sure that once that's taken effect that I'm fairly rapidly then moving to, to anesthesia. Gaseous induction, Yes, you may want to give a little bit of butorphanol perhaps with the midazolam and then go with a stepwise gaseous injection with something like sevoflurane. Okay. Um, so that, that would be my, my personal choice. Okay. Minimize the number of other drugs that you're using. Avoid the alpha-2s if at all possible. Um, but yeah, get a, get a benzodiazepine in there absolutely as you're doing right up front. Okay. Um, I think I think that's that's pretty much the only way that you're going to do it, and and just it's then all about it's about management of the procedure. So it's about having it. You know, you come in to a surgery that there aren't a lot of barking dogs in. You're quickly seen. You're quickly dealt with. So it's timing. You may want them to get in. You know, literally at the moment that you start to do your surgery cases, bring it in. Then I'll see you. I'll do it, and then out and home. Keep keep smells. Does it have a does it have a friend? Does it have a pal? Is it close to that one? Because, I mean, sometimes I've found some of these bunnies that you get their friend. I know, again, owners often push you to do this, and there's a sort of a sinking feeling where you think, I'm going to have to admit the entire household yeah. along with the rabbit. <laughs> <coughs> However, actually, they have a point, and having familiar um, uh, you know, pals around them, uh, and as well as smells, is quite useful because it's the alien environment that they are olfactory beings as well as visual and, and auditory beings, and... You put them in a strange smelling place that, that, you know, we can't smell the fact that there was a ferret in there last week, but there probably was a ferret in there last week and they're really stressed about it. That can help. And then last time he was almost taken because mm. of the smell, so he was not so interested. <laughs> He's not a lion head by any chance, is he? Sorry? He's not a lion headed bunny by any chance. Oh, yes, there you go. <laughs> we will come back to my feelings on lion headed buddies <laughs> later on. Thank you. Beautiful animals, but unfortunately, several genes short of a rabbit. <laughs> right, okay, rabbits, rodents, 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 anesthesia. So again, think about um, the pre-anesthetic exam. We need, again, the, the, the reason why, and there hasn't been an anesthetic survey that recently, the, the, the last one that was done uh, did suggest a significant um, uh, level of 
in comparison to dogs and cats, of mortality associated with general anaesthesia in uh, small mammals uh, compared with, say, with dogs and cats. Um, and the majority of these are almost certainly associated with missed um, pre-existing clinical conditions prior to the anaesthetic. The anaesthetist and surgeon were blissfully unaware of until the crucial moment. So if you have an animal that has a nasal discharge, it will have lung problems, okay? And these little hindgut herbivores, these guys are, you know, two-thirds digestive tract, one-third chest. Small chest space, limited lung uh, capacity. Rats and mice, we know that mycoplasma uh, is so common, Sendai viruses, and therefore significant abscissation in these cases is common. So they are potentially a risk. You may want, if there is any concern about this, to do other diagnostic tests or to put them on a antibiosis before you do the anaesthetic, okay? If, if the anaesthetic is postponable. We want to make sure that they are eating properly before they go through the anaesthetic. And then when I say that, obviously, a lot of these guys are presented with dental problems, so that's the problem. But we want to take maybe a day or two to push their energy balance into a positive phase rather than a negative because all of these guys are very intolerant of diabetic-associated uh, ketoacidosis. A lot of them go into hepatic lipidosis, so they've obviously been perhaps plump, well-fed animals. This may have had an impact on the dental problem. They then get dental disease and pain. They stop eating. They go into a metabolic crisis. They are lipidotic. Take a blood sample. It often is, uh, you can see the lipemia. Their livers are suffering. They are going into ketoacidosis. They are a high anesthetic risk at that point. So they're not a good candidate for doing that. You, you know what the problem is, but at that point, what you need to do is to take a day or two or maybe longer to stabilize them. Fill them with pain relief, rehydrate them, get their acid-base balance back onto normal footing, get the calories into them. We'll talk about this in the critical care side of things postpone the general anaesthetic unless it is absolutely vital and you will have much better success rate. Um, there is one other thing, guinea pigs always have food in the mouth. If you've ever, if you don't deal with, I'm sure you all do deal with guinea pigs, you're all yeah, seeing guinea pigs on a regular basis. They can be one of the most challenging uh, species to get through difficult times. They are, you know, adrenal glands covered in fur. Um, they are intensely upset by just about everything. Life itself upsets them. Um, and they always have food in the mouth. And actually, a guinea pig, when you stick a, you know, an otoscope in the mouth to have a look at the teeth, it doesn't have food in its mouth. That one is the one that should set the alarm bells off because what should come towards you is a wall of pea soup. Um, so they are actually a little bit uh, of a problem, as we'll see in a minute, when it comes to, to maintaining airway. But we don't fast these guys. Even the omnivores, even the little you know, mice and rats and things, because of the high metabolic rates, um, starving them, gut transit times, literally just being separated from the food in the period from coming from home into the clinic and waiting until they're actually anaesthetized is usually enough. We don't generally tend to recommend that you starve them for any uh, length of time, and herbivores not at all. Um, there are a bunch of pre-anesthetic pre medications um, that uh, have been used, and some of these are useful and some of them not. We have this question mark over whether or not hindgut fermenters like guinea pigs and uh, chinchillas and degues um, also have um, uh, atropinesterases. There's a little bit of evidence that they do. However, there is an awful lot of evidence that atropine seems to work. <laughs> And I use atropine quite regularly in chinchillas um, and guinea pigs, which is ironic seeing as I don't use it in rabbits. Um, and we don't tend, to, they, it seems to ablate heart block, which again is a very, very common dysrhythmia. So with most of these small guys, heart block is the dysrhythmia you are most likely to see. And atropine does seem to work in hysterichomorphs. I don't quite understand why. It may be because they're South American, and that is a lack of exposure potentially. I'm not a botanist, so I'm not familiar with the, the flora uh, of uh, South America enough to know that atropine is maybe not a common component of plants' defensive mechanisms in South America. It may not be. Um, but atropine does seem to work. However, you're going to have glycopyrrolate knocking about in your, in your bunny crash box if, for whatever reason, you're not getting the desired response with atropine. I'd move to glycopyrrolate just to be on the safe side. There is relatively little data uh, about there. But I use atropine quite routinely as a pre-med in guinea pigs and chinchillas. Why? Well, because the main reason that I'm seeing these guys is for dental problems. 
and they usually salivate badly during anesthesia, particularly if you're using gaseous anesthesia. Um, chinchillas just drool <laughs> continuously, and the atropine's quite useful at reducing that, making your field of vision easier, as well as having that other important cardiac stabilizing effect. Acepromazine, um, not used so much. Um, Hypnorm certainly has been used, we'll see in a second, uh, but acepromazine not used so much because of poor reversibility, again with the rabbits, although it's quite a nice tranquilizer. But there is a big issue associated with animals that are prone to idiopathic epilepsy, particularly the gerbil, um, that acepromazine, and there is some debate about this now in dogs as to whether it does lower the fitting threshold, but certainly I would try and avoid it. It's, it's not a particularly useful pre-med. Um, for... Uh, other species, benzodiazepines, diazepam, midazolam, um, these work quite nicely in a lot of um, the small uh, furries, particularly those that get quite stressed, so the chichetidae, uh, gerbils again because of their predisposition to seizuring, um, then low dose uh, midazolam uh, or diazepam uh, can be useful uh, in these species to reduce the incidence of seizuring, and particularly if you've got an individual um, that is prone to that, it runs in certain family lines in gerbils, um, then I would always try and pre-med uh, with a benzodiazepine if you have to do anaesthesia. Um, Hypnorm is actually technically licensed for sedation. Mice, rats, rabbits and guinea pigs um, is used at a full one mil per kilogram body weight um, in guinea pigs combined with midazolam and di or diazepam um, for general anaesthesia. There's uh, some uh, data in the notes there, but can be used at a fifth of that uh, concentration as a pre-med um, and is quite useful in guinea pigs um, to uh, ablate breath holding um, because my favoured general anaesthesia in guinea pigs is to pre-med them with hypnorm um, uh, and uh, atropine uh, and then to give them um, a, uh, uh, a stepwise induction uh, with uh, oxygen and isoflurane. Um, we mentioned ketamine and xylazine in the notes, and it's mentioned again, but again, I would um, avoid its use. I think this is older textbooks that are still, still quoting it. You sometimes find it in papers and reviews. Again, xylazine is not easily reversible. We know that it can cause myocardial hypoxia. Um, Ketamine and metatomidine as a combination in itself, you'll see there's a whole series of dosages here that have been published. Um, so some of them are really are quite uh, high. Um, so intramuscular or intraperitoneal in rats, mice and hamsters requiring 100 to 150 milligrams per kilogram of ketamine and 5 mg of xylazine. And if we're talking about metatomidine, 0.5 mg per kg um, of metatomidine with ketamine dosages usually uh, around about 50 milligrams per kilogram. So these are quite significantly um, increased dosages. Um, I must confess that in the majority of these uh, guys, um, I find much, much lower dosages, depending on what it is that you're wanting to do to the animal, uh, are more effective. And so, for example, um, in chinchillas uh, for dental procedures, um, then typically the pre-med will be um, something like uh, midazolam plus um, atropine, and that can be given sub-cut. And this again brings us back to the thing with small furries about dosing. If you're using an aqueous solution and the animal is well hydrated, subcutaneous injections are usually better tolerated than intramuscular and actually tend to be absorbed at pretty much the same rate. It is marginally slower, obviously, but to be brutally honest with you, it, it is a minute here or a minute there. So the caveat is obviously that they're well hydrated, but they're usually better tolerated. So we tend to give them a dazlam and atropine pre-med, wait about 15, 20 minutes or so, and then give metatomidine plus ketamine. Um, and typically speaking, we're giving um, a dosage of 0 0.02 mg per kg and 2 mg per kg. So 0 0.2 mg per kg metatomidine and 2 mg per kg ketamine. So it works out as 0 0.01 ml of your standard favoured metatomidine drug and 0 0.01 um, ml of your favoured ketamine combination, subcut, will produce enough sedation to do x-rays, to have a quick look around the inside of the mouth and potentially maybe even enough to burr a tooth or two with minimal cardiorespiratory effects. So it is really low dosages. So a lot of the published dosages just 
when you're looking at them, it doesn't tend to help you much because you look at textbooks and we all do, and formularies, but it is worth um, uh, checking out some of the references, particularly in things like Carpenter, very useful formulary, the exotic animal formulary. Um, they very helpfully give the references and you can go back and have a look at those references um, in the oodles of spare time that I know that all of you have um, and um, uh, have a look at A, how far back it was in time and B, also what it was they were doing and what the success rates are because some of these things you, you read the abstract and then you miss the bit that half of them died during the procedure because uh, that bit was kind of scooted underneath the carpet. It's like the ones of the intranasal rabbit thing. You know, you have to actually read the thing to find out that actually some of them died when they put them in dorsal recumbency. <laughs> All the bits in the abstract is, this works, you know, hooray, some of them died. Um, <clears throat> so it is worth um, thinking critically about these things. Um, if you want to do something surgical, something painful, then this is not enough. And you are going to have to do, give them either additional gaseous anesthesia, so isoflurane or sevoflurane, or you're going to have to use higher dosages of this. Um, so typically increasing this to maybe 0.05 or maybe 5 mg per kg, and that usually allows dental extractions and things of that nature. Depends how debilitated your chinchilla is, but again, um, it's about not rushing in and doing something when the animal is in a critical state. It's about stabilizing the animal in the first instance, gives you better chances of a successful outcome with the surgery. So ketamine and metatomidine, there are lots of recipes combinations that are published um, in the notes, um, but I've given some in there. I used to use um, acepromazine uh, with atropine uh, with chinchillas, and I've moved to midazolam, and I find it slightly better. Um, so you will see, I think I've written in the notes there, acepromazine. Having said, I don't use it. Um, but uh, I did used to in chinchillas. It seemed to work in them for some reason. But actually, I think midazolam is better. Um, so I've, I've moved to, 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 to midazolam with these guys. What dose did you uh, 0.5 mg per kg. So it's quite a low dose. You can go up to 2 mg per kg for seizuring activity and that sort of thing. So it's 0.5. So it's quite a, quite a low dose. But it just takes the edge off the chinchilla, makes it quite relaxed. And then, again, particularly when we're dealing with alpha 2s, we don't want wind up. And a lot of these animals, the reason why if you just barrel on in there with an alpha 2, you sometimes don't get the desired response you want is because the animal's been wound up severely. And we know this in you know, domestic cats and dogs. You wind them up and the metatomidine ketamine doesn't work. Um, so it, it's exactly the same for these guys. Problem is these guys don't show you they're wound up. They just sort of sit there, and, you know, literally the rabbit in, rabbit in the headlights. Um, Inhalation um, anesthesia certainly is um, my favorite if we're talking about anything surgical, so neutering, um, uh, any sort of orthopedics, anything like that, then I, I will certainly induce the anesthesia, um, uh, or sorry, pre-med the um, animal with drugs like um, fentanyl fluanazone, maybe low dose, metatomidine ketamine or a midazolam atropine combination. But then I'm gonna go with a stepwise induction with um, um, oxygen and uh, gaseous anesthetic. Um, isoflurane is fine. Sevoflurane is good, certainly for debilitated ones. I will use one word of caution. Is anybody using sevoflurane in guinea pigs on a regular basis? Yes. How do you find it? Yeah. Yeah, it's not, yeah, it, 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 it can be used. Okay, so there's no two ways about it. It's not a case of it's a bad anesthetic. It's not a bad anesthetic. The problem with it is that you have to understand with the physiology of the guinea pig is that the guinea pigs at the depth of anesthesia that you need with sevoflurane to do something noxious to the guinea I mean really noxious, like surgery to a guinea pig, is often at that critical level where the guinea pig gives up breathing. That's the problem. And because we have a problem with intubating guinea pigs, if you can intubate your guinea pig, it's not a problem because then you have control of the airway. The problem is the anatomy of the guinea pig that makes it difficult to intubate. So if you thought rabbits were a challenge, guinea pigs are absolutely a challenge. Not impossible, but they are very difficult. And they're difficult for two reasons. The first one is the pea soup. So you have to spend some considerable period of time during the induction process sticking cotton buds in the mouth and just removing all that pea soup from the mouth because there's no point in sticking a tube through the oral cavity covered in all that lovely gunk and then pushing it into its trachea. Um, that's obviously going to be bad news after the, after the op. 
Um, the other problem is that they have this thing called a palatal ostium. So a palatal ostium is basically, if you look into the mouth of your, your G-pig, at the back, you can sort of see the soft palate, and then you can see the underside of the epiglottis. Okay, so you've got teeth here, you've got the smooth pink back of the mouth, and then you've got this arch, obviously, which is um, the, the underside of the epiglottis trapped behind the soft palate. Okay, so that's similar to, to any other animal. The problem is that there is a little bit of bone in here that holds that in place, so they are almost locked. It is possible to unlock it, but only at the tip. If you try at the sides, it's actually very, very difficult to get round it. So you literally have to poke your ET tube in at this point here midline and then force down the epiglottis to insert your ET tube into the trachea. So it requires a bit of effort. It's much more difficult than a rabbit, where a rabbit, you just push on the soft palate and the soft palate flips above the epiglottis and the epiglottis just drops into view, the whole of it, and it's there and you can put the ET tube in. With these guys, it's a case of you actually have to kind of almost push it over the top to get it into it. It is possible to do it, but again, narrow, small oral cavity. You're going to need a long Wisconsin Zero Blade or one of these uh, rabbit uh, laryngoscopes. You're going to need to make sure the animal is properly anaesthetized before you do it because it's going to be stressful to do this. You need to take time to remove the pea soup from inside the mouth, and then you have to go for the intubation. So, they are a challenge. If you've got a really um, long op, or you've got a, a, a difficult critical case, it is worth doing. However, um, certainly uh, in guinea pigs for routine ops, I have historically used just face masks. And in that case, I will use isoflurane because we don't get that same narrow margin of um, apnea at the right depth of anesthesia with isoflurane as you do with SIVO. So it's not a case of SIVO is bad, SIVO is very good with mammals and it's very good with debilitated ones. It is just slightly problematic when it comes to guinea pigs because if you don't have control of the airway, they stop breathing, then where do you go? The other things obviously that you can do with the G-pig to make life easier for you is remember again the anatomy and have it on a tilted table or a slope. Okay, and this helps with bunnies as well. So if you're putting it in dorsal recumbency in order to do a spay or a castrate, then you know, have the head end up. Let the guts fall away from the diaphragm. The diaphragm breathers get the weight off it. Okay? So do, and, and obviously during the op, periodically, you know, the anaesthetist should be checking it because there's a sort of slump that sort of occurs during the, during the op. They sort of need to be sort of gently pulled back up the slope again. Uh, so a tilting table usually is, is, is better for these things. Um, so yeah, so be aware. Sevoflurane can be used, but it's got a narrow safety margin. Uh, I know I, I'm fairly happy in saying that, as I say, because I've spoken with Paul Flecknell about this on many occasions, and he's broadly in agreement with that, that, that it's about the depth of anesthesia that you require with Sevo to do surgery. You can immobilize them for radio, radiographs and things in an oral exam, not a problem, because you're at a quite a light plane of anesthesia. But then try and you know use a, a scalpel, you, you're going to need to deepen them. Uh, at the point at which they may well become apneic. Again, circuit-wise, we're looking at small, low-volume um, dead space, mini veins, potentially Mapleson C's, um, these sorts of circuits, because we don't want lots of dead space um, that's going to significantly cause a rebreathing effect. Um, yeah, so recumbency, as I say, make sure that they are sufficiently um, uh, uh, pressure's taken off the diaphragm. Do be aware that, you know, if we're spaying something the size of a junger and um, hairy-footed hamster like this, you know, the, the, the body surface area to volume is enormous um, in these little guys. Um, so consequently, we do need to make sure that they're um, dramatically perched on a hot hand um, or, uh, no, they're, they're on some form of um, uh, heated uh, mat, preferably radiant, because there's not going to be enough weight to actually trigger a pressure-sensitive one. We're going to need to be in an ambient environment that is, um, uh, uh, you know, 
mid-twenties, we want to be using warm fluids, and we want to be speedy uh, with our surgery and do minimal um, surgical scrubs. So, you know, we're not, we're not, and certainly avoid surgical spirit um, to avert it, avoid anything that's going to cause evaporative, uh, significant evaporative heat loss in these guys. Minimal scrubs, minimal clips, quick surgical times. Again, putting warm fluids back into the abdominal cavity if you're doing uh, exploratory laparotomies to keep the core temperature up. Um, these are all important. Um, as far as uh, monitoring um, anesthetic is concerned, um, then we have relatively few um, uh, features that can be used um, to accurately monitor. You can, um, for the larger ones like guinea pigs, um, you know, do ECGs on these guys with sticky pads on the feet. Again, heart block is a common feature with them. Um, pinch reflex is typically used. We don't tend to see the fall limb issue that we see in lagomorphs um, in most of the rodents. Um, eye position um, is not useful again with these guys. Interestingly, just ketamine um, or ketamine combinations, palpebral reflexes tend to be uh, maintained in a lot of animals. Um, and actually with ketamine metatomidine low dose like this when we're doing dentals and chinchillas, the good thing about that, apart from the fact that it tends to be, uh, have relatively little physiological impact on the animal, is that they maintain a slight swallow reflex. So if you're doing anything dental-wise and you're, you know, you're potentially putting you know, saline-soaked swabs in there to you know, bird a tooth or something, you're trying to keep you know, the, the dust down inside the mouth, actually they have a swallow reflex. So if anything does uh, lurk its way to the back of the throat, then actually they, they will swallow on the back of that. Um, but for a deeper anaesthetic, we have limited um, uh, physiological reflexes um, that can uh, be used. In guinea pigs again, if we're using capnography, end tidals of about 30, 35 millimeters of mercury, typically are the kind of levels that we're wanting to aim for. Um, with these guys, intubation uh, is just not, uh, well, certainly not possible in the, um, of the Russian hamsters. Uh, it is technically possible to intubate rats um, and some of the larger mice. Um, they are an incredible fiddle and you have to adapt um, IV catheters um, and mostly we do them blind. Um, so we're again adopting the same technique um, that we're doing with rabbits of picking them up, having them sternal recumbency, picking the head up um, and using uh, a fine IV catheter midline um, to run uh, across the hard palate, down the soft palate um, and if it's midline guiding into um, the trachea. But they're not easy to do this with and the vast majority we do on face mask. Um, so we, we are taking uh, a calculated risk, which is why it's so important to make sure that their health going into the anaesthetic uh, is optimal. I think what we'll probably do is we'll have a caffeine break there because that's quite a, a, a session that we've um, looked at. Um, were there any questions initially on that before we, we get to the end? Yeah, Karen. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a difficult one. And I guess that, yeah, the, the, the issue is um, I, would, I, would, I would go to Burton's or, or go online at one of the auction sites and pick up 50 quid's worth of Isotec and just keep a bottle sitting in the back of a... Of, of a it, it comes to reptiles as well. You'll find that some reptiles, if you're just using gaseous anesthesia, phenomenally difficult to maintain anesthesia just using cesafluorine. Um, so we find this with leopard geckos, with bearded, well, not bearded dragons so much, leopard geckos, um, uh, and uh, some species um, of uh, snake um, can be very, very difficult to uh, induce, certainly with SIVO. They just don't breathe um, fast enough to keep it uh, in the body system. Um, and we believe that there's a shunting mechanism, which is an interesting one we come on to uh, reptile uh, anesthesia. There is some 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 uh, recent data that suggests that other drugs may be able to influence how well some of these gaseous anesthetics work. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would personally stick with the isofluorine because the problem with the injectables is yes, you could use um, uh, Medket in in G pigs. I personally would prefer to use Hypnorm plus uh, Medazolam. Uh, because that one has been around for a long period of time. There's a lot of data on it. It's very safe. Um, but uh, once you've given the injectable, it's phenomenally difficult to then reverse the anesthetic. 
you can't reverse the ketamine, you can't reverse the fluamazone depending on what you're using. Um, and at least with the gases, you have full control. So yeah, I, I go with the isofluorane. You can use SIVO, I think, for, for the minor procedures, and you may be able to, to do that with a combination of uh, local anesthetic blocks and things, things like castrations, and maybe some midazolam pre-meds. You may get away with minor procedures. I think when you start to get to things like orthopedics and you're doing more serious involved ops where you need a deeper level of anesthesia, they just stop breathing. And that's the problem. And then you've got nowhere to go unless you intubate. So that's that's your other option is stick with the, the SIVO, but then spend a bit more time working with them to get them intubated. Yeah, um, uh, we've seen a couple of, of, of initial ones there. Um, the, the problem is insertion. Um, and yeah, it will be very interesting to see that if that comes through. You're still not removing the soup in the mouth issue, uh, which you need to spend a bit of time removing. The other problem is the insertion is actually getting it to the right point. Um, uh, because getting, getting that epiglottis fully into the oral cavity is incredibly difficult to do. And you don't want to be too rough because it, you, when you look at it with the laryngoscope, it's surprisingly well vascularized. So you're looking at it and you're <laughs> poking around at this thing and it's, you know, going to bleed any second. I have had a rabbit have a significant epiglottal bleed because it was blind intubation and poked too many times. Um, it was okay, but, you know, it's, it's kind of scary when the back of the mouth fills with blood and you're kind of going, oh. Um, that's not a, not a good place to be. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I hopefully, you know, watch this space. That, that there will be something that will be useful that will come out of that. We'll talk about the critical care. Actually, in a lot of cases with these emergency ones, in a moment of, you know, um, blind terror as the thing is, um, is crashing in front of you, actually going straight in and doing tracheotomies is the easiest route um, with an over-the-needle catheter um, or, in the case of rabbits, just doing a cut down. They're easy. They're really easy. And if you've got a life and death, you know, I can't intubate, right, just do a tracheotomy. Um, and even in rats with a, a hypodermic straight in. Um, and then you can connect it via, you know, these little uh, ET tube connector sets that you can buy, which are the bane of everybody's life because they always fall across the floor of the, the operating theatre. Nobody gets them back in the right holes. There's always the one that you want is missing because it's on the end of a, an ET tube somewhere. Um, you never find it in the moment of crisis. Right, I think we'll have some caffeine, um, if that's okay, and then we'll um, be back in 15 minutes. Is that right? Lovely. <laughs>